getting organized is not about doing more, it's about doing less. And while that is a clever sound bite that I made up, it is in fact true. So what I want you to think about is, um, if you've ever tried to get organized and you've tried to impose this artificial system on top of your already busy, hectic day and you found that the system broke down for you, that you couldn't quite maintain it or that you could keep it up for a small period of time and then it just sort of dissipated, that's because you're trying to do something on top of what you're already trying to do. My philosophy of getting organized is really about eliminating everything that is non-essential to your life so that you are spending your time doing what is important to you, and, and then you will become organized. So it's not, it, it's not about um, clever words. It is, in fact, about eliminating those distractions that are keeping you um, busy and uh, ineffective or less effective in your day. Getting organized is not a hobby, it is a means to an end. So again, going back to that artificial system that you might uh, have previously applied on top of your day, you, I don't propose that you replace disorganization with some sort of hyper-organization so that at 2 o'clock in the morning you're reconciling your checkbook in some sort of manic way. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a viable alternative in, in my world view. If what you value is um, compassion and um, promptness, but you don't actually manifest that on a daily basis in your life, either it's not really a core value of yours, or you're making a lot of small intermediate choices between, that, between your core value and what you're actually spending your time doing. Your level of stuff Equilibrium is different than mine, but the idea is you want to have enough of whatever it is that provides comfort and convenience in your life. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that anybody become an ascetic and you know, live with just a rice bowl and a, and a pair of chopsticks and a robe. It's not required. <laughs> but whatever stuff equilibrium is for you, that's where you want to get to so that you have enough of everything and nothing that's superfluous or doesn't serve you. Whatever that amount is, I mean, I don't have an agenda around what that is. The point is, once you've reached stuff equilibrium, then we apply the third rule, which is something in, something out. So that when you're buying a new pair of jeans, it's because you're replacing a pair of jeans that, that you'll no longer wear. You, you, when you replace a pair of sneakers, it's not that suddenly the old pair becomes the pair that you're going to mow the lawn in. So you're not going to let them go. You're just going to put it in the closet and, and try to remember to put them on when you go outside to do the lawn. That's not going to happen. So those can now be recycled, and we're done with those. The two main wings of the, of the triangle are one home for everything and like with like. If you do that, you will solve 85% of your problems. One home for everything, like with like. One home for everything means everything has only one home. It's either in its home or it's being used. So your keys have a home in your house. They're either in your hand, they're unlocking something, or they're in their home. You'll never not find your keys if they're always in their home or you're actually using them. The home is not universal in the sense that my keys live in their home in my house, your keys live in your home in your house. It, in my house, it's a hook just inside the, the front door. In, in your house, it might be in a tray on a table just inside your front door. It needs to be near the front door, and it needs to actually be in something. The top of a table is not a home. It needs a vessel or something to corral it so that it's not like you just throw the keys on a surface and they're in their home. That, that's not a home. That's a general sort of toss. And when, you, when, it, when it comes time to find your keys, you'll be looking under magazines and other things that are not in their home to try to find the keys in their home. So my question would be, which I can understand because my husband is like, what is this? The importance versus sentimental. And that's where it's a tough decision. Right. Well, I mean, if, if the sentimental attachment is that somebody you were related to historically touched yes. it, that's not much of a sentimental attachment. If, it's, if, it's, if this is an object that, you know, your grandmother drank out of every day and now you want to keep this, that makes sense to me. If it was in a cupboard on a third shelf that she never used, and just the fact that she owned it at one point, that's a different, I mean, that's a different attachment. That's, that's some sort of familiar relationship 
but it's okay. not necessarily a sentimental attachment. It's not like when you were sick and visiting her, this is what she always served you tea in. Do you okay. understand? I mean, that, that's that clears the, that's a little more clear to right. put some attachment with the amount of sentiment that's with the. Person. Exactly, I, I and the know. and the okay. other thing that I want to talk about that very briefly is be very careful of fetishizing objects and charging them with the responsibility of carrying an entire lifetime of memory, <laughs> because when that <laughs> object breaks. You will, you will, in essence, lose those memories. It is much better to hold the memories in yourself than to charge this with the responsibility of summing up your entire relationship with your grandmother. <laughs> this, is, this is a temporary object. You know, and, and, and when it breaks, you run the risk then of losing that connection with those memories instead of remembering them all the time. I mean, this is too small to hold all of those memories. I have uh, two, uh, uh, two grown daughters, and my attic, uh, much of it is uh, their childhood things that they've collected, uh, school papers that they did when they were in kindergarten and things like that. And great, great. I, yeah. I got it. I got it. What? So I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, uh, old math homework, not a sentimental object. <laughs> it was there so that they could learn their timetables. Um, that's it. They're, they're done. When I mean, think about your own lives. If that's what your mother handed you as the end of, here, go out into the world, here's your math homework from second grade. <laughs> that's not a sentimental object. Now, the, the drawing that you made that was really quite something, that might be something to keep. And if it, again, if it, is, if it was that beautiful, then why isn't it framed and on the wall? What if, about their first printing? Like in the first grade, when they first started their first letter writing. And how old are your kids? 29 and 26. <laughs> okay, so this is what you do. I mean, they're adults. Do they have their own children? No, no. No, but almost. Um, why don't you ask them, how important is this stuff to you? I mean, do they have their own homes? Yeah, but they don't have the room to store it, so I'm you, storing it. Yeah, I mean, this is, th this is, not, um, this is, this is not for you. Um, this is for them. I mean, okay. these, are, these are adults. If it's that important for them, then you need to have a conversation with them, and we are out of time. So thank you all very much. Thank you.